Look, Brexit has a huge uh, ramifying effect on international trade. Um, because of the uncertainty at this stage, uh, it means that many of the potential trading partners that we may have uh, after we assume competence to do that negotiation um, are reluctant to engage with us now. Um, more than that, businesses are already feeling the effects of things like the, the drop in the value of the pound. That's having a serious impact on many businesses. I was with one business this morning that says to me, look, we've just expanded, um, we've just uh, gone into new premises and taken on more staff and, and, and more equipment, quite simply on the basis that we will be expanding into Europe and, and suddenly we're hit by this. Um, and just the change in the value of the currency is going to mean 300,000 off their bottom line next year. Now, this is a small business, a small medium-sized business, um, but it's going to suffer a severe financial hit. And businesses up and down the country, it's not just the big boys that are, are, are feeling this. It, it's small, medium-sized companies that are feeling it. So I'm working with them to talk about what the shape of a a trade deal should look like, what their needs are, whether it's in terms of skills base, whether it is about uh, finances, um, and making sure that then we relay that to the government in, in the criticisms that we put of government policy, uh, in the questions that we put in Parliament in holding them to account. Look, um, nobody wants a running commentary and they know that as well as we do. N nobody is asking the government to set out the details of its negotiating strategy, which sectors will get what tariffs, what non-tariff barriers will apply in this area and not in that, what sort of visa provisions. Nobody's saying that. Uh, that, that is really a red herring. Uh, but it's a convenient one if your ministers are not agreed amongst themselves as to what the shape of the eventual deal ought to look like. Look, it makes sense before you go into a negotiation to know roughly what you want to get out of it. And, and clearly the details of the negotiation are to be had during the negotiation and nobody's asking the government to give their hand away. Um, but I think what we did almost three weeks ago now in the Opposition Day uh, debate that we held um, was we made sure that the issue of parliamentary scrutiny um, was conceded by the government. Um, they did concede that, they made a, a minor amendment to the, the motion that we'd put forward because they realised they didn't have the votes, even on their own side, they were going to be outvoted on that. Um, so that was a very important landmark in this whole approach to how we as the sovereign parliament leave the EU. Um, that of course has been followed up by the High Court decision um, and the judiciary have, have then in effect said, look, the arbitrary power of the monarch cannot be used to overturn laws that were passed by the sovereign parliament. And that's a constitutional uh, principle that the, the courts have upheld. Um, but I, I think much more important than that really is strategy and tactics. Um, if I were the government, I would want to be able to begin the negotiations with the European Union Commission um, by saying, look, we've had a vote in Parliament, everybody in the UK is now totally behind us that this is what we need from you in terms of our future relationship. And have the strength and the confidence of that behind you before you begin the negotiations would seem to me a good thing. It's not something the government should be afraid of. We need to reach that consensus in Parliament, in the UK, about what the best deal looks like. And that's what I hope we'll do in the coming months. I think there are a number of elements uh, that really 
people voted on and that they want to see delivered. Um, one certainly is they want to feel that the UK has in some sense regained its sovereignty. Now, sovereignty is a, a, a very difficult thing to, to grasp, but of course that was one of the things that the court in their decision was very clear about. It was for the sovereign parliament to decide when Article 50 had to be triggered. Sovereignty is important and, and it's, it's right that the new relationship that we have with Europe um, should make us more able to control our own affairs than we were previously. The second element, I think, has to be the economy. One, one has to say, well, look, um, we don't want to be doing something that is going to make people in this country worse off. We don't want um, to leave the European Union in such a way that we're going to lose jobs, um, lose uh, our standard of living and see that decline. Um, so that's really critical. Um, but of course much of that is bound up with the access that we have into European markets, both the passporting uh, in terms of financial and legal services, um, but also uh, in terms of the the access that we have for our goods. Um, and in order to have the greatest amount of access, there may be an element of uh, compromise that has to be made on the free movement of people. And, and this is a critical point because it is clear that many people in the UK voted because of their fears about migration. Um, so this, this is why this is a really sensitive balance. You're talking about sovereignty, you're talking about economic well-being, you're talking about migration, um, and of course you're also talking about the amount of money that the UK used to pay to the European Union. Now, it only takes a 0.6, a 0.6 drop in our GDP to see all the, the gain that we would have, that's the net difference in what we used to pay in from what we used to get back from the European Union, wiped out by leaving the EU. So economically it has to stack up. Economically I don't think we should be worse off than we were before. Um, and it's very difficult at the moment when you're thinking about new trade deals with uh, other countries outside the EU that we can't yet quantify, where there's real uncertainty for them as well as for us, because they, they don't want to do a deal with us unless they know whether by doing a deal with us they can trade into the EU or not, or on what terms they can trade into the EU. So these are all very difficult, very uncertain questions, mm. but that's why we need Parliament to look at it very carefully and to decide is this the right general shape of a deal and is this the right time to be triggering it. Well, that is going to, you, you say sectors of our economy. The key thing is to look at the countries that we're going to be doing the deals with. And of course the sectors of our economy that mesh most closely with that country's own mm -hmm. infrastructure and its own needs, it, it's going to be, I think, um, playing this sector by sector, country by country. You can't just say, well, the financial services sector is the most important sector for our economy, therefore we have to prioritise that. There's no point in perhaps prioritising that in a country where you know there is no openness uh, to that market. Um, I mean, in fact, if you look at what's happening in India only today with the Prime Minister's visit there, we can see that there has been very strong resistance to opening up financial services and legal services for over 20 years. Um, and that's unlikely to change. But it's very interesting to see that the, the pushback that um, she has got in India has been, look, um, you want our business, but you don't want our people. Let's talk to each other about visas, is what they're saying. 
They're saying, why have you cut back on student visas? Why have you cut back on post-study work visas? These are highly skilled, highly educated professionals um, who if they did a couple of years work experience in the UK, we would be able to build trade relationships on the back of that into the future. Yet the government's cut back on that. Um, so what they've said is, look, we need to have a very serious conversation about increasing the number of visas that we have into the UK from India. Um, and if we can talk about that, then maybe we can talk about some of the other things that you want to talk about. So as I say, you always have to, in any negotiation, you have to understand what your counterpart, what your opposition wants. And then you've got to look and see what you have that you can give. And if in this rhetoric of a, a free trade world beyond the European Union, Britain simply reduces all its tariff barriers and, uh, and minimizes its non-tariff barriers, as largely we have. We've been a leader of free trade, and that's a good thing. I don't, don't knock that at all. But what it does mean is that we're in a position where we have less to offer. Because we can't say, well, at the moment you have a 40% tariff on bringing in textiles into the UK, therefore we will cut that back to 5%. In a negotiation, you have to have something to negotiate with. So you can't just say, well, we are going to set everything low, now why don't you do likewise? If, if we say that, people will, other countries will simply say, well, Thanks very much. We're very happy for you to set the tariffs and the barriers at a very low level. We'll take advantage of it, but don't think that that means that you're going to get access to our markets in the same way, because we want to protect them. So it really is about looking country by country, understanding what each country needs. Very often, if you look like a, at a country like Brazil or a country like uh, um, America, North America, uh, that may well be around agriculture. Um, it may be needing to see the way in which they can uh, bring their agriculture into the UK. We then need to see what we can give on those fronts without injuring our own farmers and our own agricultural produce um, in order to perhaps trade for uh, financial services.